Damn it, I don't have a signal. Maybe the antenna array is out. It's on the observation deck. Maybe we can fix it. I'm sure the view is nice. Hold on, did Jill just wink at Parker? This is definitely for mature viewing audiences. Resident Evil Revelations is one of the best spin-offs in the franchise. Its quality sits well within the mainline titles for what it sets out to do. It's a middle ground of sorts, keeping more of a survival horror approach of the titles prior to 4, with gameplay in the mold of the 4-6 era of Resident Evil. The best comparison I feel would be the Lost in Nightmares DLC from Resident Evil 5. It's a fun little romp, I had about 6 hours for the campaign in total. There's also Raid Mode, which takes a different approach than Mercenaries, but has its own values as well. It's a story structured like a TV drama that keeps switching through characters and keeps you guessing till the very end, for better or for worse. It's simplified as it was made for the 3DS first, so it does strip things down to the core of what Resident Evil is. But the core it has here is excellent. It does make a few tweaks to the formula as well, some working better than others. For this version, I'm playing the PC version here, not the original 3DS version. This does tie into how the game was made. It was built from the ground up with the 3DS in mind. The reason for building on the 3DS was to tackle new hardware and new markets. Resident Evil has an interesting history with handheld devices. One release was Resident Evil Gaiden on Game Boy Color. There were also some fascinating prototypes that were never released. A version of the first Resident Evil on the Game Boy Color. There was a version of Resident Evil 2 on the Game Boy Advance. While they never released, it's amazing to see the technical wizardry that was played here in order to get them running on that hardware. With the advances in tech for handheld, Helds, a team at Capcom decided to try a game more in the modern vein on the 3DS. A large portion of Capcom was working on Resident Evil 6 at the time. There is a bit more room to experiment here with lower sales expectations. This resulted in the team going back more to a survival horror focus, but with the modern gameplay. The challenge was getting the MT framework, which Capcom was using at the time for the games running on the 3DS. There was another team working on Mercenaries 3D on the 3DS, who worked in tandem with the Revelations team. Mercs released first, so that title got the tech side sorted out. The team here for Revelations went with a television drama structure. This was done as a design choice for being on a handheld device for shorter play sessions. The structure also allowed for a larger cast of characters than past titles. It was also used to keep the player guessing up until the very end of what was really going on. I wouldn't call this a complete success. In some cases, this structure works against the game, but we'll tackle that shortly. The 3DS version was released in early 2012, and Revelations would then be ported to a number of systems starting in 2013. So playing on PC with the ups scaled MT framework, game still looks great. I've always enjoyed the character models on this engine. As great as the current RE engine is, it does suffer a bit of that photorealism, uncanny valley effect. It's really noticeable with some character models that I've mentioned in past videos. The soundtrack here is excellent with plenty of memorable tracks. The most notable ones come at the very tail end of the game where there's this very unsettling choir that goes on. I wish there was more of this throughout the game, but more on that later. While playing like Resident Evil 4 and 5, the big difference in Revelations is getting to move and shoot at the same time. Enemies were designed around this fact. Enemies are still fairly slow in that classic vein, but the way they move around helps offset this change. I count this as one of the better successes of Revelations getting this to feel just right. There's a wide variety of enemies to deal with here. With the ship setting here, the focus here is more like creatures of the sea. These are humans exposed to the T Abyss virus, known as the Ooze. They have some great memorable designs. And of course, there's some classic enemies as well throughout. Not the best in the series, but definitely not the worst. There's a dodge here that we could use, and you have to time it right for it to activate. There are a few cases here where the dodges didn't land when I wanted them to, but I wasn't yelling, I dodge at the screen like a certain Let's Player would. Better than the dodge system in the 1999 version of Resident Evil 3, that's for sure. Did you pick up your new equipment from Quint? Yeah. Genesis or something. Is that its name? You didn't bother to read the manual, did you? No, uh, I brought it with me, just in case. One additional feature here is the Genesis, a scanning device. This is used to scan rooms for items. Because we couldn't see ammo laying there before, I mean, it's not like these boxes of ammo are tiny or anything. Scanning enemies will boost the number up to 100, in which we get a green herb, then resets. 
Green herbs can't be mixed, and the game makes use of the screen to give us indication of health instead of a health bar. So our main incentive for scanning is to get more green herbs. We could scan various handprints throughout, but that's just for collecting. So going in, I was thinking it'd be like Metroid Prime. Instead of just using notes, we'll scan instead to piece together what's going on on the ship. But no, it's just mostly there for the herbs, which we could find anyways throughout, and there are notes throughout to tell what's going on here. It is a bit of a letdown, because this approach works well in other titles. I would have loved to see that used here and try to piece together what's been going on. There is a brief bit where the game switches it up when we scan to navigate lasers. The game could have used more sections like this to change things up a bit. The Genesis does serve as a bit of a palette cleanser and it does the job well for pacing but there is a lot of room for improvement here. As we jump back and forth in time and location some episodes are more straightforward. However, most of the game is spent on the ship. Here there's more of that looping level design of past titles but there's no real inventory management. There are item boxes, well, upgrade boxes, where we can upgrade our gear. We'll find upgrade gear throughout. We can move it from one gun to another. There's plenty of them that are hidden and give you some incentive to explore the levels. It is a bit of a letdown to have something more in the classic vein and not really have item management be part of the game. To me, that's what really feels like classic Resident Evil. Even though 4 and 5 scaled back on that, they still had limited inventory. The only real limits you have here is how many weapons you could take, as you can only take 3 weapons at a time. But everything else is in the factor. This 3D map here is pretty iffy compared to the classic maps. As the game does cut back and forth between areas on the ship and elsewhere, there were some points where I had to think and look at the map and go, okay, how do I get there again? It wasn't exactly embedded in my brain. To note, I also didn't have the mini-map enabled. There's some quote-unquote hidden loading screens with the use of doors. I'm thinking this is more of a 3DS limitation which scaled over and not a focus when they made to PC or consoles. And that's fine, it's not like they take too long or anything. Elevators are the same case. Although sometimes I would get in the elevator and head up or down, but my partner got left behind. So instead of warping in, I had to go back. There's also this odd situation with doors where you walk through and it closes right away. However, if you're right behind your partner, you could get through without waiting for the door to close. When it comes to puzzles here, mostly we have these wire puzzles. Some of them took a bit of a feel to get what they were looking for. They can be good challenges, it's just a bit disappointing that this is more or less it for puzzles. There's one in regards to weighing coins, but that's about it. To summarize the overall gameplay, Revelation mostly hits the mark when it comes to blending the feel of the survival horror focus a more action-oriented gameplay. There are a few stumbles along the way. I do wonder how much of this was due to initially designing on handhelds at the time. Still, excellent work overall. Previously on Resident Evil Revelations. The game is structured like a TV drama, which in some ways works for it, and in some ways works against it. Since the 3DS was the initial design, they wanted to have shorter play sessions. Episodes take roughly 20 to 30 minutes. And in between episodes, we'll get a recap. Previously on Resident Evil Revelations. Previously on Resident Evil Revelations. Previously on Lost. This is both fine and a bit annoying. If I'm going to the next episode, I probably just played the previous one. I don't need to see this, I just played it. Of course, you could just skip it, and it really feels unnecessary. That said, having these recaps is one of the few modern design choices I can appreciate in games. I'm sure we've all played some game that takes 20 plus hours, and for whatever reason, we don't play it for a few days, weeks, months. And it can be hard to get back into. Luckily, most games now will give a brief recap to refresh your memory. I can see where they're going with this whole TV drama model trying to copy it, but in a way, since it's fairly short, it doesn't really need it here. So now we're going to go through the game and plot, so now we're getting into spoiler territory here. Using the TV drama structure, there's quite a large group of characters here, more than usual. We'll hop back and forth between characters we play frequently. The two main returning characters here are Chris and Jill. Chris is, well, Chris. This is just shortly before the events of Lost in Nightmares DLC for Resident Evil 5. And Jill has had a bit of a change-up. This isn't Julia Voth as the face model for Jill. It's a Bosnian model, Amra Selagic. It's not a huge difference, but it is noticeable, especially when compared to, say, the model they used for 3 Make. And that wetsuit? That's some nice fan service. Jill is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal here. There are other characters we could either briefly control or will accompany us. There is no co-op mode here. It's all controlled by the AI. They can't be killed and you don't have to worry about their inventory. The game at various points will separate us from our partner to dial up the tension. Parker will be spending most of his time here with Jill. Parker is okay. Not much to say on him beyond his charming accent. All right. That should hold us for now. He's fairly straight-laced like Jill, but he does let up at some points with some humor. Then we have Jessica. Oh, Jessica. She's an amusing character. She's very much the hot basic bitch. I 
think you're infected. Careful, Jessica. Sorry to drag you into this. That's fine. But you're buying me dinner next time. And I'm ordering lobster. <sighs> this cave is too cold. You should have worn your thermal underwear. You know, she must have Live, Laugh, Love hung up somewhere wherever she lives. I didn't realize this until later in the game, but this is the same voice actress as Liara from Mass Effect. I certainly hope so. My feet are killing me. Yes, it's a beautiful ship. And I ran into Joker. He seemed happy to see me. And Jessica does pry into Chris about Jill. She knows what's up, and she's saying what we're all thinking. So, Jill, was it? It was what? Stay focused. She was your partner before, right? Yeah, my partner from before. What about it? I was, you know, just asking. Sadly, we never got time with just Jessica and Jill, because I would love to see how that would have worked out. Her outfits are hilarious with her rugs in the winter and this one-legged wetsuit. Was she getting fashion tips from Titus? It's really funny to also watch her throw herself at Chris to continue that Redfield bloodline, but you know how Chris is. The ship doesn't have much longer. We can't let this virus contaminate the sea. We've already searched the Queen Samiramis. He never got the hint. What a drag. Maybe he's already taken, Jessica. Parker, the only thing they're taken by is their work and strictly platonic friendship. Other characters we'll spend a bit of time playing are Keith and Quint. While they are competent in what they do, they're very much the comic relief characters. For a bit there, it was driving me up the wall who these two were reminding me of. Then it clicked. They're like a more competent Corey and Trevor from Trailer Park Boys. Grinder, I'm gonna go check out the terminal. Get fun with these. Quit! Don't just leave me here! Damn computer. You two, get ready to move. Ah, uh, I hate snow. Snow hates you. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yes! Thank you very much. We did it. Oh, no. oh. <laughs> See, Corey? Green wire. I told you, the green wire. Come in. Jackass here. Give me a sit rep. Hey there. Any idea where we can find Parker and Jill? To Jessica? <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, hold on. <laughs> The story is pretty simple to begin with, but then spins out of control with what it focuses on. We get some background here into the BSAA with our boss O'Brien and the FBC. The FBC leader here looking like False King Alant from Demon Souls. There's also Conan O'Brien, I, I mean Raymond here as well. So there was this city, Terragrisia, the first to sustain itself via solar energy. The city gets attacked by Il Veltro. They're a terrorist group who made use of BOWs. The city is then essentially nuked by satellite to sterilize the city. We play this section of flashback as Parker and Jessica. The Terragrisias. No more. We came to help, but did nothing. Most of the game takes place on this abandoned cruise ship. Jill and Parker are in search of Chris and Jessica, who have gone missing. Honestly, if they kept the whole game to the ship, I would have preferred that. Not that the other sections are bad. They have their moments, and they are well paced. But they're mostly straight line point A to point B. I prefer my RE games interconnected, which the ship delivers in droves. One thing to know is how the story changed in this game throughout its development. If you go back and watch one of the initial trailers, there's this Chris doppelganger. You think you'll get away with this? I already have, Jill. Did you? Do you have it? Maybe. You'll have to kill me to find out. <laughs> and what would you do if you found it? It doesn't matter. Because you're already. Seeing as how Resident Evil 6 also made use of doppelgangers, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons they went with a different direction. Also, it looks like we were going to get zombies initially compared to the ooze enemies that we get here. This is also the third time in this series that made use of a ship setting, with a couple of prior spin-offs making use of it. I mean, it works. It's isolated, it's remote, the atmosphere delivers. It's when you get to the back third or so of the game that things get pretty wacky and a bit hard to follow. Surprise! There wasn't just one ship, there were two ships and they were on the other ship. Then it turns out the BSAA leader has been in cahoots with the terrorist group Veltro. Then it turns out Conan O'Brien here was part of Veltro and is shot dead. Then it turns out he wasn't dead. Surprise, Jessica is the spy for the FBC. <laughs> J 
Jessica! Don't worry about dinner. Now we're even. I'm sorry, Parker. <laughs> Parker gets shot and ends up sacrificing himself. But hold on, the FBC are in cahoots with Veltro as well. The leader of the BSAA was doing some 4D chess shit to prove the leader of the FBC helped orchestrate the destruction of Terra Grisha. O'Brien keeps Chris and Jill in the dark. And he has his reasons for doing so. The mountain hideout, and the coordination of the ships, all to put heat on Morgan. But sir, couldn't you have at least told us? I couldn't risk it. Not with a mole inside the BSAA. Much better reason what Chris did in Resident Evil Village to Ethan. Eventually we reach episode 11, which is called Revelations. It feels like the game is going to wrap up here. That's a great game trope, making use of the title for the last chapter or level. But psych, there's a third sunken ship in another episode. This is where the evidence is held of the FBC involvement with Veltro. And while the atmosphere has been really good throughout Revelations, here it really kicks it up a notch. There's this unsettling choir music that kicks in. It's too bad that the rest of the game couldn't keep the atmosphere at this level. We find the leader Veltro, who really hasn't been mentioned up until this point, who's gone off as rockers. What follows is a very satisfying boss fight that makes good use of the game's mechanics. I haven't mentioned the bosses up until now. They're well done throughout. Great designs and areas to deal with them. Not quite to the extent of, say, Force bosses, but very well done. We wrap things up here. The evidence against the FBC is found. They're dissolved. O'Brien, not Conan O'Brien, steps down to the BSAA leader. You thought Parker was dead? Nope, he survived. That does take a lot of the window of his sacrifice scene, which was well done. Good times, Jill. It was a nice ride. What? See you guys. And then another surprise. Jessica wasn't working with the FBC, but was a spy for Tricell, the company that's probably featured in Resident Evil 5. Same with Conan O'Brien here. So I don't know where Jessica's basic bitch act ends or how much of it is real. She's reading the Divine Comedy at the end here. And this is something that pops up here and there throughout the game. It's somewhat comical at this point where it's just lying around this guy's desk. So that final boss that we encounter on the sunken ship who is off his rockers, before we reach him, he'll cite some passages from the work in a very unsettling atmosphere. By each one to be dreaded, who doth read that which was manifest unto mine eyes. Each one shall find again his dismal tomb, shall reassume his flesh and his own figure, shall hear what through eternity re <laughs> But the biggest twist of all, when Chris and Jill reunite, they partner up. You can't choose between the two. And the game makes you play as Jill. I was shocked at this considering how much of a hard-on that someone at Capcom has for Chris. I guess this title didn't have tons of oversight when Capcom was all hands on deck for Resident Evil 6. The plot here feels more like Metal Gear Solid in a way than Resident Evil. I think this scene from Phantom Pain summarizes it very well. What if she's a spy? What if I'm a spy? You? The aspects about the T-Abyss virus, the BOWs known as the Ooze, they're mostly background fodder here. It's all about these agencies and spies trying to outplay one another. I mean, that's always been a part of Resident Evil, but here it really goes nuts with it. Too much, I'd say. This game loses a fair amount of focus with the constant jumps between characters and factions. Their goal was to keep you guessing until the end, and on that, they did succeed. However, with such focus on that, it does create a less coherent story that would have served better if it was a bit more straightforward. If the game was longer, they could have paced this out a bit more. Because to begin with, it looks like they had this great setup of trying to find Chris and Jessica on the ship, like a mystery to piece together. Hell, if they had the scanner approach with the Genesis to something like Metroid Prime, it would have been a great blend of using that to piece together the story. So while the game itself is well done, it really could have been quite a bit better if the structure that they went with didn't get in its own way. But hey, that's what happens with spin-offs. You could try out different things that might not see themselves into the mainline series. Not everything is going to land the way you want it to. Oh. 
Rachel on the scene. Revelations does not have a mercenaries mode, but instead raid mode as its minigame, which makes sense. After all, they just released Mercenaries 3D for the 3DS six months prior. I do prefer the Mercenaries minigame overall, but raid mode does have its merits with what it does. It kept me playing longer than I thought, and I was only scratching the surface. Unlike Mercenaries mode, you're given the choice on your weapon layout here. There's tons of choices in regards to characters. Each will have bonuses to various types of guns. Our goal is to get the emblem at the end and take out the enemies along the way. Score depends on time, accuracy, enemies killed, and damage we perceive. Throughout stages, we'll encounter the occasional buffed enemy. They may be like a tank or have some little manlet rage. With our score, we're given BP and XP. BP can be used to buy from the store. You could buy weapons, you could replenish ammo, custom parts, upgrades, and more. I do have to note the interesting choice that while we'll get ammo throughout the levels, we can also use the store to replenish them. This does add another layer of decision making when choosing a level and a character. On the XP side of things, we level up. Some weapons can only be used once you hit a certain level. Progressing through stages will also level up enemies as well. It can become a bit bullet spongy as a result. It may require revisiting past stages. I do think this is the biggest issue with raid mode. If they just stuck with BP and getting better equipment, I think this would work just as well. I mentioned that the lack of item management was an issue with the main campaign. However, due to the amount of choices you have here, it does bring some of that back in a different way. Choosing whether to spend those points of yours on upgrades or replenishing ammo or simply doing so in levels. What was called mercenaries mode there, the version village pulls much more heavily from raid mode. It does miss out on some of that frantic energy that mercenaries had. Here, enemies have set placement and not the random elements that mercenary mode throws your way. Still, being a spin-off, they did some experimentation and came up with a minigame that's an excellent addition to the series. Overall, Resident Evil Revelations mostly hits the mark of what it sets out to achieve. It sits well in regards to quality with the mainline series. It hits the right balance of survival horror aspects of old and mixing it with the over-the-shoulder combat. There were some noticeable absences of features, and not all the new ones hit the mark. However, overall it's a success in its execution. And this wouldn't be the only Revelations game, which I do look forward to checking out. And it's been rumored for what seems like years now that we may see a third entry in the series. I certainly hope we do. If you do enjoy these videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. I do a weekly update about video progress, I talk about various interesting things I found in the news of gaming, you get access to videos earlier. Thanks for enjoying everyone, Boulder Punch out.